Okay, so this past weekend, a really good friend of mine who lives in New York called and said, how are you feeling about the 99 conference? And my answer was, what do you think is the least invasive way to extract eyeball juice from a first grader? And his response was, oh God, are you in that place? <laughs> and I said, no, really, this is, here's the idea. There is a total pink eye epidemic in my son's class. And if I could get some of the juice, I could give myself pink eye, which would be a legitimate excuse not to go. <laughs> and I could even like, you know, do a selfie with like a big eye and then it would be legit. And he said, I thought you were excited. And I said, I was excited. But as I was working on my keynote, I realized that I had kind of tricked myself into believing that this was my tribe. And then I realized like my obsession with fonts doesn't really make me one of you. <laughs> um, and he said, well, why did, you know, what was going on when you thought you were one of them? And I said, I don't know, I'm gonna have to think about it. And he said, you're a researcher, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not, you know, a creative. And I said, no, these are the creatives, these are the people that no one sat with in high school and then everybody wants to be when they grow up. <laughs> um, I'm a researcher. No one sat with us in high school, no one still sits with us. Um, <laughs> so I thought about it and I thought, Okay, so I'm a researcher, I study connection, I study vulnerability, I study love, and then I realized why I thought you were my tribe. I think it's because design is a function of connection. There is nothing more vulnerable than creativity. And what is art if it's not love? So it made sense to me to be here. And then I thought, okay, 99% perspiration, they said don't talk about inspirational stuff, talk about the how-tos. So, you know, my name, sometimes I name my keynote presentations things that'll make me feel better about being here. So this one's called Sweaty Creatives. Um, <laughs> because I know what it means to be a sweaty creative. Um, because I create all the time when I write, the way I translate my research, when I talk. And I know what the perspiration feels like. And so what I want to talk about today is the perspiration that no one talks about very often. And that's not the perspiration from the hard work and the laborious part of creating, it's the perspiration from fear, from the cold sweat, the stuff that pops up on our eyebrows when it's not supposed to be there because we're presenting an idea or talking about something that we care about. And then we're begging our body not to sweat like when they said, we're filming you against black, could you wear something else? I'm like, uh, no. Um, <laughs> that 99% perspiration thing, I'm down with that. I got that. I won't be wearing, I'll be wearing, uh, yes, my option will be navy. Um, so I know about sweaty creatives. So I want to tell you about something that changed my life as a creative person. And it's a quote from Theodore Roosevelt, and it has completely, I mean, I know it sounds cheesy and cliche to think a quote can change your life, but sometimes when you hear something, when you need to hear it and you're ready to hear it, something shifts inside of you. And so my story is that I'm, I am a researcher and I never thought I would have a big public career. Um, and so I did a TED Talk that went very viral, and in the wake of that, I was kind of everywhere for a couple of months, on every CNN.com, NPR, it was everywhere, and something I wasn't used to. And the marching orders from my therapist and my husband were, do not read the comments online. <laughs> so I read all the comments online. <laughs> um, and so one morning, I woke up, and there were two or three new articles out, and I started reading the comments and they were devastating. Um, they weren't about my work, they were about me. They were super personal. And they were the things that creative people play in their mind and then give up doing what they really wanna do. Like if I asked every single one of you, you would try, what would you try 
if you knew people would never say this about you? What would, that, what would this be? It were, those were the comments that morning. Um, of course she embraces imperfection. What choice does she have? Look, what she, look how she looks. Um, I feel sorry for her kids. Um, less research, more Botox. Um, just mean, personal attacks. The things that really, up until that moment, had inspired me to stay very small in my life and my career, just so I could avoid those things. So that morning, Steve and the kids leave. I stay home. I get on the couch, and I watch eight hours of Downton Abbey. <laughs> and when it's over, I don't want to turn off Downton Abbey. Because the minute you turn off Downton Abbey, then it's like soccer practice and dinner and back to the mean people. And maybe, should I get Botox? And maybe, you know, maybe if I stand still when I talk. Um, so I get out my laptop and I do a search for who was president in the United States during the Downton Abbey era. Have you ever done that? Like you, you're numbing with TV or a movie and so when it's over you just like stay in that space by like learning more about the actors and what's going on. Um, I've been doing this long enough to know that this is like, you're laughing with me, not at me. Um, so I put it in and Theodore Roosevelt comes up and a quote comes up. And I read it. And this is what it says. It's a quote from a speech that he gave in the early 1900s at the Sorbonne. And a lot of people call it the Man in the Arena speech. And this is the passage that changed, changes my life. It's not the critic who counts. It's not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done it better. The credit belongs to the person who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred with blood and sweat and dust, who, at the best, in the end, knows the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, he fails daring greatly. So the moment that I read that, I closed my laptop, and this is what shifted in me. Three huge things. First, I have spent the last 12 years studying vulnerability, and that quote was everything I know about vulnerability. It is not about winning, it's not about losing, it's about showing up and being seen. The second thing, this is who I want to be. I want to create. I want to make things that didn't exist before I touched them. I want to show up and be seen in my work and in my life. And if you're going to show up and be seen, there is only one guarantee, and that is you will get your ass kicked. That is the guarantee. That's the only certainty you have. If you're going to go in the arena and spend any time in there whatsoever, especially if you've committed to creating in your life, you will get your ass kicked. So you have to decide at that moment, I think for all of us, if courage is a value that we hold, this is a consequence. You can't avoid it. The third thing, which really set me free, and I think Steve, my husband, would argue has made me somewhat dangerous, is kind of a new philosophy about criticism, which is this. If you're not in the arena also getting your ass kicked, I'm not interested in your feedback. <laughs> Period. That's it. You know, I, I, you know, if you have constructive information, feedback to give me, I want it. And you know, I'm an academic. I'm hardwired for wrestling around with stuff like that. If you say, hey, you forgot all this literature, or hey, you should have done this, or terrible sentence construction over here. Like, let's go, let's, let's do it. I love that. But if you're in the cheap seats, not putting yourself on the line, and just talking about how I could do it better, I'm in no way interested in your feedback. So I know about the sweaty creative, and so what I want to do today is I want to talk very specifically about the arena. This is where, this is where we sweat. How many of you know this feeling by just looking at the picture? <laughs> yeah, show of hands. How many of you know this feeling? So this is what we do down here. Like, I don't know what you do down here, but what I, I, I set up camp down here. I like string up twinkle lights, I order takeout food. Um, I live down here sometimes, just dreaming about the day that I come up and how awesome it's gonna be. Like, but I, I stay down here a lot. And here's what we do. What, the arena's right there, you can see it, the light's there. 
And the fear is this. I'm scared, a lot of self-doubt, comparison, anxiety, uncertainty. And so what do most people do when they're walking into the arena and those things are going to greet them up top? What do you do? You armor up, right? This is where I would imagine the old days that they got all their stuff on. But God, that stuff is heavy. And that stuff is suffocating. And the problem is when you armor up against vulnerability, you shut yourself off. And I've said this to audiences before, but I have never said it to an audience where it is more true than today, the second. When you armor up, you armor up in this hallway, you shut yourself off from everything that you do and that you love. Because vulnerability is certainly a part of fear and self-doubt and grief and uncertainty and shame, but it's also the birthplace of these. It's the birthplace of love, of belonging, of joy, trust, empathy, creativity, and innovation. Without vulnerability, you cannot create. So what I think you're asked to do as a creative on a daily basis is walk through this hall, get to the top of the stairs, and get naked. <laughs> of course. <laughs> get naked. Get really real. Put yourself out there and walk out there so people can see you and see what you've made and see what you're doing. So when we walk out, this is what we see. Lots of seats, lots of people. But we focus in, and we focus on this, the critics. I used to think the best way to put your work out into the world is to make sure the critics are not in the arena. But you have no control over who's in the arena. And the best way I have found is to know that they're there and to know exactly what they're going to say to you. Because each of you know. The three seats that will always be taken when you walk into the arena, when you share your work with someone, the three seats that will always be taken are shame, scarcity, and comparison. Shame, completely universal human emotion. We all have it. It's that gremlin that whispers, you're not, you're not enough. Or if you're feeling pretty confident, like this is, I went through this like in a, when Scott was talking, I went back and forth from like a, like a ping pong table with gremlins, back from, oh my God, I'm not enough, I'm not enough, to I can do this, I can totally do this. Oh, who do you think you are? That's the other gremlin, that's how it works. Like, look at you, big for your britches. Um, I clearly have Texas gremlins. Um, I don't know that everyone says too big for their britches, but that's what my gremlins say. So shame always has a seat. The other seat that's always taken is scarcity. What am I doing that everyone, what am I doing that's original? Everyone else is doing this. 150 people are doing it who are better trained than, I'm tra than I am. What am I contributing? Does this really matter? The third seat, always comparison. How many of you ever struggle with comparison? Oh my God, comparison is a nightmare. Um, you know, I made a pact not to talk to anyone in the green room because what I was afraid that I would end up doing is say, so what are you talking about? <laughs> That's interesting because I'm going first. Um, <laughs> and so if it sounds super good, and I think I suck comparatively, I may say that. And then I'm catching a flight to Dallas. Um, comparison is always there. The fourth seat I left open for you. You gotta know who's in the fourth seat. Is it a teacher? Is it a parent? Is it a shitty ex-coworker? Am I the only one that's ever had one of those? Um, <laughs> The thing is, I don't care what people think. I don't worry about the critics in the arena. 
sends a huge red flag up for me. We're hardwired for connection. When we stop caring what people think, we lose our capacity for connection. When we become defined by what people think, we lose our capacity to be vulnerable. Not caring what people think is its own kind of hustle. Trust me. So rather than locking these folks out from the arena, what I'm gonna invite you to do, this way maybe, is reserve seats for them. Which doesn't seem like a good thing to do. But I have 13,000 pieces of data, and I've done this work for 12 years. And what I have found, and what I have learned from these folks, and then try to apply it in my own life that has changed my life, is to reserve a seat, to take the critics to lunch, and to simply say when I'm trying to do something new and hard and original, and I'm trying to be creative, and I'm trying to innovate, to say, I see you, I hear you, but I'm gonna show up and do this anyway. And I've got a seat for you, and you're welcome to come, but I'm not interested in your feedback. The other piece that's tough is, to me, if you're gonna spend your life in the arena, if you're gonna spend your life showing up, really showing up, there's a couple things that you need. The first is a clarity of values. You have to, like, I know. Like, when I came out here, I knew I could screw this completely up. I could get booed off stage. Bad things could happen. But I don't have a choice, because if courage is my value, I have to do this. Whether it's successful or not, it's irrelevant. So a real clarity of values is important. The other thing is, you got to have at least one person in your life who's willing to pick you up and dust you off and look at you when you fail, which hopefully you will, because if you're not failing, you're really not showing up but who was willing to look at you when you fail and say, man, that sucked. <laughs> yeah, it was totally as bad as you thought. <laughs> but you were brave. And let's get you cleaned up, because you're going to go back in. And this is someone who loves you not despite your imperfections and vulnerabilities, but because of them. And they should have great seats in the arena. Like, I forgot for five, ten, for a decade, I forgot to invite these people into my arena. Because, you know, it's the old, um, I always want to say Karl Marx, but it's Groucho Marx difference. Um, <laughs> I'm a social worker. We read a lot more Karl than Groucho. Um, I didn't want to belong to a club that would let me in. I forgot to invite people because I thought, if you're, if you're my fan, if you're here supporting me, how important could you be? Like, I'm trying to win over the people who hate me. You simply love me. You simply hold my hair back when I'm puking. <laughs> you pay bills with me and raise kids with me. How important could you be? I'm looking for the stranger in the mall. That's who I'm trying to win over. <laughs> yes or no? OK. The last part is. So I guess the real specific how-tos are this. The world keeps going, whether you know it or not. The critics are in the arena, whether you identify them and think about the messages that keep us small. They're there, whether you do that or not. What I have found in my life and what I have found in my research, which fueled what I did in my life, um, is that the people who have the most courage, who are willing to show up and be the most vulnerable, are the ones who are very clear about who the critics are. The ones who reserve seats for them and say, I hear you, I get it, I know where the messaging's coming from, I'm not, I'm, not in, I'm not buying it anymore. So to get very clear, the last thing, which I think is the hardest, is this. One of these seats needs to be reserved for you. One of these seats needs to be reserved for me. I need, when we look up and we're putting an idea, our piece of art, our design forward, who do you think the biggest critic in the arena normally is? Yourself. And so, definitely me. Like, I have never watched either of those TED Talks. 
because it's not in service of the work for me. And I try to do things that are only in service of my work because what would, what would it serve for me to watch it? I would sit there and go, oh my God, suck in your stomach. Oh my God, that's not what you were gonna say. You know, we're so self-critical. And one of the things that I think happens, and I think this happens a lot, it happens in different professions, but I think I, I see it a lot with creatives, is there is an ideal of what you're supposed to be. And what a lot of us end up doing is we orphan the parts of ourselves that don't fit what that ideal is supposed to be. And what it leaves when we orphan all those parts of us is it just leaves the critic. And so reserved in this seat is this. Where we came from, how we started, our families, that's me the oldest of course, The lost years, <laughs> the years where I was so lost and confused and hurt and disillusioned that I thought the only path to freedom was a flock of seagulls haircut. <laughs> um, the higher the hair, the closer to God, we say in Texas. <laughs> the people who love us, the moments that make us who we are. And in that chair should be this person. The person who believes in what we're doing and why we're doing it. And the person who says, yeah, it's so scary to show up. It feels dangerous to be seen. It's terrifying. But it is not as scary, dangerous, or terrifying as getting to the end of our lives and thinking, what if I would have shown up? What would have been different? So here's to Sweaty Creatives. Thank y'all for having me here today. I really appreciate it.